Um, so glad to be here with you guys. And yeah, you know, no matter what background you come from, living in a broken world, being human, being raised by humans, um, we all have baggage, we all have hurts um, that we carry with us. And so for me, my parents had me when they were teenagers. Um, my mom and my dad have both um, extensively struggled with addiction in their lives. Um, my mom, alcohol, my dad, drug addiction. And so growing up in that environment, it was very chaotic, it was very traumatic. Um, there was a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of really difficult things, abuse. Um, and so that's kind of the background that I came from, became a believer in high school. Um, and I feel like have, am continuing to grow, am continuing to heal. Um, but yeah, brought all of that, brought all of that into marriage. And so what's unique in relationships is neither one of our backgrounds, like, exclude us from the difficulties that come in dating, right? Tish's broken background brought with it a whole backpack full of baggage and trauma that made dating really difficult and a struggle and dangerous in some ways. And, and, and for me, even coming from what appeared to be like this beautiful, perfect, supportive family, there's still baggage. No one's exempt from baggage. Right? No one's exempt from hurts and pains and struggles that we bring into it and sin that we bring into relationships. And so whatever your background is here, maybe you relate more with Tish's family, maybe you relate more with my family, um, you're not exempt from the difficulties when it comes to dating relationships and pursuing marriage. Right? We all come to those same places. Tish was in a long-term, unhealthy dating relationship her entire high school um, life. And uh, I never had a, a relationship that went beyond two dates, um, but was just always dating someone different and never actually would open myself up to actually get to know someone and really care for somebody. Right? We both came with different, um, different baggage to that relationship. And so we want to say that we stand up here very humbly. You know, we stand up here not as experts. Um, we are blessed that God uses us as a therapist and as a pastor, but we stand up in our humanity. And um, that would really be our hope that you could take, um, could connect with that, could take that away. Um, that we're very much um, struggling, healing, um, clinging to grace ourselves and very much wanting to like come and in our 45 minutes encourage you to do the same. So as we're thinking moving forward here, here's kind of what we want to shape uh, our, our time around is this, is that dating is not a um, biblically negative or biblically positive thing. Right? In fact, you're not going to find dating really in the Bible. It, it's not there. There's no text that we can turn to and go, okay, here's the dating passage. Let's read through this and understand this. There's, there's marriage passages. There's ones that talk about that. What, what dating is, is it's, it's an avenue by which our culture has created that you transition from singleness to married life. Right Now, our culture also uses dating for a lot of, a lot of things that aren't transitioning to married life. It's recreation within our culture. But, but the, the healthiest idea of it is that you would be in a process of transitioning from singleness to married. That doesn't mean the first person that you date is like, hey, well, if I'm going to date them, I know that they're going to be my spouse. I'm, I'm 12, but I'm pretty sure this is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with, right? But, but it does mean that throughout every dating relationship you have, bad and good, that it is shaping you and teaching you and preparing you for marriage. Every broken heart Every, uh, every fight, every disagreement, every time that you've been used, every time that you have used someone else, those are things that shape who you are for marriage and prepare you, right? Every time you experience love purely, it shapes you for that relationship should the Lord bring that to you. And so that's the point of dating. The point of dating is to be in the process of preparation for marriage as you learn to love and to be loved by another person, to care and to be cared for. Within that, we want to give you today just four theological foundations for dating, four theological truths to shape your dating life around. Because what we believe is that the scripture would, not, even though the scripture doesn't explicitly talk about dating, scripture should define how we date and what dating looks like. And it also defines really the struggle of dating for us and how to go into it understanding that. The first theological truth that we want to lay out for foundation of dating is this. You were created. Right, number one, you were created. 
Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, you were created. God made you. He made you intentionally. And he made you male and female intentionally. There is a distinct difference between men and women by God's design. And so God made you the gender that he made you specifically with a purpose in mind. He didn't mess that up. God made you specifically with your personality in mind. He didn't mess that up. He made you specifically with your looks in mind. He didn't mess that up with your, your skills and your abilities. With, he, he made you intentionally. And it tells us there in Genesis that he made you in his image, which means this. You are who God created you to be. We'll see in a moment, sin hijacks that and sin can twist that and sin can, can, can kind of bend that at times. But you are at the core of who you are, who God created you to be. You're not an accident. And you have value simply in the fact that you were created by God. You don't need a boy or a girl to give you value. You don't need the affection of someone else to give you value. I don't need my wife's love to give me value. It feels good. I love it when she respects me. I love it when she speaks well to me. I love it when she cares for me. But that is not what gives me value. My value is in the fact that the creator God made me specifically and intentionally. That he loves me. Right? My value is in my creation by him. That truth also tells us this, though. That he knows me better than I know myself. Right? He created me. I didn't create myself. So he made me and he knows the inner workings of my heart and of my mind and of my body in ways I don't know. What you and I are aware of is what we feel like we need today. So all of us live in the operation of what do we feel like we need today? That's what drives our decisions. What do I feel like I need today? And God looks at you knowing you completely from before the world began, forming you in your mother's womb, and then he knows your very last day you will live. He knows every day of your life and every detail of it. He sees it all and knows it all in this moment. And so he knows better than you do what you actually need. And so when we come to this place where what we feel like we need today lines up differently with what God tells us we need in life, we would be very wise to step back and go, he knows me better than I know myself. I think I can trust him more than I can trust my feelings today. So our first theological truth for dating is you were created. And that means you have value. And that means that he knows you better than you know yourself. You can trust what he says when it comes to your relationships with others. You are also broken. God created the world perfect. There was no tears. There was no disease. um, There was not even fear or shame. And when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the fruit, sin entered the world and crushed and broke and tore through God's creation, bringing destruction, bringing um, shame, bringing separation from God, bringing separation between, um, between each other, bringing brokenness to our bodies. And so now we're vulnerable to disease and to to sickness. And he also, um, uh, because of sin, um, creation was cursed, and so us with it. And so a little baby, um, we have a five-year-old son, and as soon as he could speak, what do you think he started to say? No. And he didn't have to learn that. We didn't have to teach him that. The Bible tells us that we come, um, that we are conceived in sin and that we come into this world with sin. And so by nature, we are sinners, but also we are impacted by the curse. And so we are um, impacted by the brokenness and the sin in others. We are impacted by the brokenness and the sin in ourselves. And that is the reality of living on this side of heaven, that we feel the sting of death, 
that we feel the sting of broken relationships, that we feel the sting of someone who should protect us and should love us well, and, and they don't. And they hurt us instead, or they're selfish instead, or they're absent instead. And so although we are maintain the image of God within us and our great capacity for love, and within all of our hearts, we maintain the absolute need to be seen, to be held in the mind and the heart of another for connection. And there's so much hope in that. And that drives us into relationships, drives us in desire to very much feel the need to be seen and understood and known by our mom and by our dad and by our friends. And that drives us with desire to very much want to be um, known and seen um, in, a, in, a, in a deeper way, in, a, in an intimate way, in the unique way of, of love relationships. And so what we want to, what we want you to hear from us today is to, to be awake to that. Be awake to the reality of the curse and the brokenness within yourself and around you. And the good news is that um, redemption. The good news is Jesus is stronger and that he's able to redeem as far as the curse is found. Praise God for that in me, in you, in us, and in our relationships, but that that is not a destination that we're going to arrive, but it's a journey that we're on. And so when you approach relationships, um, dating relationships, um, be awake to this. Keep this in mind. We need help with this. We need people around us speaking into us and supporting us. We need to be um, pursuing our own healing, our own growth, because in our dating relationships, emotions are super intense, right? Someone touches your hand and you're like, what just happened to my body? It's like an electric shock went through, right? This is real life. The emotions are so intense, and that is because that is the way God has created you and designed you. And so because the emotions are so intense, it makes dating relationships, romantic relationships, very vulnerable for our brokenness to manifest itself and kind of reaching out and seeking out um, our worth and our value in creation instead of our creator. And there's some some practical things within that, depending on like your family of origin. If you came from a family where you were neglected, then there's probably going to be tendency to want to crave someone else's affection more. And right? if you never felt father or mother um, give you love and care, never speak those words to you, never touch you affectionately, then, then there might be craving to have that. You're trying to get what was supposed to be yours um, as a child from loving parents in a safe place, and you're trying to get that from somebody else, right? This is how that brokenness in your parents, which brought about a broken childhood, affects the way that your body and emotions desire to be in a relationship. Or, or you, have, you have someone like, like me who had a lot of that for my family, um, but I had a lot of death um, around me, just, just people dying left and right in my life. And, and, and because of that, always a little bit hesitant to completely let myself in and really be known because it will hurt a lot less if I don't give myself fully to this person. If I lose them, it won't hurt as much if I don't really know them and they don't really know me. All right, so, so I would protect myself, protect myself from that relentlessly. Right, there's a number of things within your life that were traumatic things, perhaps, the way that your parents loved you, the way that you were cared for, perhaps death, perhaps images that you saw, things that you were exposed to, bullying that you've gone through at school, different things like that, that affect the way that you in the broken world will respond to another person to find affection and value and purpose in that person rather than in being created by a creator and bearing his image. Right, so as Tish said, be awake to that, recognize that. Begin to recognize your feelings of, why do I feel this way? Think, just pause for a moment and go, why do I feel so desperate for this person's affection? Right, that says something about you. You're all carrying a bag. Grab your bag, open it up, and look in it every now and then. 
and invite people who love Jesus and are older than you to walk with you through that bag. And one of the worst things you can do as a 14-year-old is invite another 14-year-old to be your counsel of whether or not you should date somebody. They don't know what they're talking about. Right? Invite someone who has gone through dating trials, hardships, brokenness, made a lot of mistakes, and they love Jesus, and go, could you come speak into this with me? Could you give me wisdom in this? Not just one, two, as many of those people as you can. I want you to speak into this. The scriptures tell us in Proverbs that with much, much counsel comes much wisdom. So seek wise counsel, godly counsel, experienced counsel to help you walk through your emotions and your feelings as you enter into that. That is a way that we can fight the fall within our lives, a way that the Lord will redeem this brokenness in you. Yes, and so you are um, also loved, the third theological truth. And so you are created um, in the image of love. So God is love. You were created in the image of God, and you've also been created in the image of a triune God who dwells in perfect love and unity within, him, within his own self. And so it is imprinted on our hearts. It is imprinted in our bodies. We literally carry this imprint, this, this image of God that, that, um, that has created us for love to be to be loved and to love. And so what that means for us in a, a world that's been cursed by sin and death and by um, the own brokenness that we carry within our own, in our own bodies, our own, our own bones, our own minds, it means that we have a very real alive need to be loved. And that that is a healthy, healthy need. Okay, it is, um, it is wired within you, you, um, in all of us. And because of this wiring to, to be loved and to love, it can draw us very powerfully into relationships. And so it's so important that we um, can continually be growing in the knowledge that God loves us, that he loves us perfectly, and that he has demonstrated this by coming um, to earth, wrapped in flesh, putting himself in our place, dying on the cross, covering our sins with his own blood and purchasing for us his righteousness, eternal life, making us sons and daughters of God, For God so loved the world, so loved you, so loved me that he sent his only son so that we would not perish, but that we would have eternal life. The problem, the difficulty of this is that we don't, I don't know about you guys, but I sometimes don't feel like that's true, right? It's like my head knows a lot of stuff that sometimes my heart struggles with. And it can be really frustrating of like, why don't I feel like it's true? And our brokenness rises up to answer that, you know, with all kinds of lies. You're not lovable. You're too needy. If people really saw you, they would reject you. You're not enough. Right? All of these lies within us that kind of jump to answer that question, creating in us even a greater frenzy to feel loved, to be loved. And so kind of as we are journeying through life of being able to hold that healthy need and bring that to healthy places, so primarily bringing that to truth, bringing that to Christ, who loves you perfectly and unfailingly, and it isn't based on you doing the right thing, being the right thing, trying hard enough. It's not based on the product that you're producing. I'm having enough quiet times and I spent enough time um, praying and I, I go to church enough. And so th therefore I'm good enough. Therefore God is pleased by me and with me. Let me just encourage you that if you are in Christ, 
he is pleased with you. That if you are in Christ, when he sees you, he does not see sin. He does not see brokenness. He sees a redeemed, whole, new daughter or son of God. But for us, we are still in the process of learning that, learning how to hold our frame in that. Because when things happen in life, it is so hard not to collapse under lies. And so what we want you guys to hear is that there's a very healthy need in you to be loved, to be treasured, to be championed, to be seen, to be respected, to be adored, to be comforted, protected, and that that can lead us to a lot of unhealthy behaviors. And so a lot of that might feel because there's not a healthy alternative. And so what we're telling you is the healthy alternative is um, gospel community, is relationships, is discipleship, is growth. But before any of that, it's all about finding your peace and your rest that you are loved. Um, even just yesterday, my wife and I were in counseling together. We go every week. And so we were sitting talking with our counselor, talking through this very thing uh, for me of at 39 years old, been married 15 years, have two beautiful children. Um, I still, on a daily basis, wrestle with feeling like I'm accepted and loved. I wrestle with feeling like that for my wife, not because she doesn't show me that, but because there has been a lifelong battle within me of that struggle of truly believing that there's anything within me that is lovable, mm. right? And so that affects the relationships. In dating, it made me chase after the unhealthy relationships in unhealthy ways. And even within marriage, to some degree, it always keeps a little bit of a distance there. Always makes me doubt motives and intentions. And it's something that I'm still actively working through. And so also here, it's okay. Right, of course, in a broken, fallen world where people use us and abuse us and toss us away when they're done with us, of course, you may feel like there's nothing lovable in you. So hear the truths we've said. That feeling comes because we are a broken people in a broken world. But the reality is you're created by God and you have value and he loves you deeply. And so you keep fighting for that. You keep chasing after that day after day and year after year. And you do so, like Tish said, in, in community with others who are followers of Jesus who will remind you of that. And ultimately then, guys, the person that you're dating should be someone that's reminding you of that as well. Should be someone that you remind of that and someone that is reminding you of that. Not solely, if that's your only like spiritual accountability partner, there's a problem there. But that should be a part of your relationship. The part of your relationship with anyone in any type of relationship should be to encourage each other to remember, remember the truth that you are loved first by Christ. So if that's ever void in a relationship that you're in of any sorts, it's a relationship that's missing a very healthy component, especially in a dating relationship. The fourth truth that we'll share with you is this. You are waiting. You are waiting. Now, I don't primarily mean like true love waits, like got a ring on your finger, you're waiting for a wedding night, though that's biblical, right? To, to do that, that is biblical. We're talking beyond that. You're not waiting for a girl or a guy, not primarily. Ultimately, you're waiting for Jesus, right? Not in like that weird, I'm dating Jesus, so I can't date you type of way, right? I'm just, just, I'm just dating Jesus right now. Don't really need a boy, right? None of that. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you've put your faith in him, or as Tish a moment ago, if you're in Christ, right, if you've put your hope and faith in Jesus to forgive you of your sins, then the scriptures tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that you are like one betrothed to a groom and you're awaiting the day that you get to see them. You're betrothed and you're awaiting the day you get to see him. 
At the time that was written in Corinthians, the, the, the practice of marriage and dating in the Jewish world was that you would become engaged or betrothed to someone, and it was a little bit different than our engagement. Our engagement plays out a little bit more like, hey, do you think you want to get married? Sure, I'd like that someday. Okay, let's consider doing that. That's basically engagement now. It's like, we like each other. Yeah, we might get married, and we might not. We could break it off. We could change our minds. In their day, engagement or betrothal meant you are covenantally bound to this person though you were not yet entered into marriage relationship with them. So you've been promised to them, they've been promised to you. The groom, the guy, he goes off and he starts preparing financially and preparing his house and getting everything ready. The girl goes home, she stays in her dad's house, and that would oftentimes take about a year. You're promised to each other, but you're not sleeping with each other, you're not living with each other, you haven't consummated the marriage yet, the marriage ceremony hasn't happened yet, but you're promised under covenant to each other. It's the father's responsibility to that bride to keep her pure for her husband throughout that period of waiting. Right, so he would take it upon himself to make sure that no other guy came in and lured her away. No other guy seduced her. No other guy like wooed her with a better house than she was going to get from the other guy. Right, keeping her focused on her promise to this man that she's been promised to. So Paul uses that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and he goes, you, the church, you Christians, you have been betrothed to Christ. If you've entered into faith in Jesus, you've been betrothed to him, promised to him, you're in covenant with him. He's preparing a place for you right now. And Paul saw it as his responsibility to help as the father to this church, keep the church purely chasing after Jesus so that he one day could present the church to Jesus at the time that they saw Jesus face to face in pure faith. Now, what we take from that in this seminar is this. All of us who have placed our faith in Jesus are waiting one day when we get to see our true groom, our true love. The one who loves us deeper than anyone else ever will be able to. Who knows us further than anyone else will be able to. By placing your faith in Jesus, you have entered into a marriage relationship with him, a spiritual marriage relationship with him. And you're awaiting the day when you will get to see him face to face, like the bride walking down the aisle and seeing the groom. And there will be joy and there will be celebration. There'll be relief. I've made it to this day. When all of your longings to be accepted by someone find their completion, in the face of Jesus. Because we're waiting for that, that means in, in our dating and in our marriages, our goal is to help each other continue to wait for that. Looking to that as our ultimate hope. That is where our hope is in, not in each other. And so my goal is to help Tish get to Jesus faithfully. And her goal is to help me get to Jesus faithfully. And there's a different responsibility we have to each other as husband and wife than there is in dating. But a dating relationship is any relationship, as in any relationship among Christians, our goal is to help each other get to Jesus faithfully. And so strive for that. Strive to push each other. That means you protect each other's purity. That means you protect each other's hearts. That means you don't say things haphazardly that you don't really mean and you back out of quickly. That means that you love each other and care for each other, help each other, serve each other. Or you're pushing each other to Jesus. So four theological foundations for dating to help you think about what dating can look like. You're created in God's image, therefore you have value and he knows you better than you know yourself. You can trust him. You, were bro you are broken because of sin, and that affects all of you, not just your sin, but the sin that is done to you and suffering and pain and brokenness in this world, which fills your bag that you bring into that relationship. Be aware of that. Know what you're capable of. Know what your heart, where your heart is broken, and come into that with a, an awareness of that, having people walk with you and to seek healing in that, because the Lord will redeem you, because, thirdly, he loves you. He pursued you and he loves you and he continues to pursue you. Mm -hmm. Unlike anyone else ever will, he is a faithful pursuer. And so fourthly, wait. Wait patiently and wait faithfully for him. One day, all the brokenness of our heart will be healed in his face. What a beautiful day that will be. 
And until then, every relationship we have, including dating, is for the purpose of helping each other wait for our true love. With that being said, we've got about 12 minutes here. Open it up for Q&A. Yep, they put it up. Oh, got all this spam texting. I'm having something delivered from Amazon. This person said, hi. Hello. This person said they like my vest. Thank you. Um, how do you know when you have met the right person? How have you known? How do you discern God's will for your life? So a couple of things. I'm going to make this practical. So one, <clears throat> I would say that you are noticing these like marks of health in the relationship. So one, you feel um, challenged by them in your own process of growing in Christ. You see in them a passion for Christ. You see in them a determination to grow in their own um, as a man or as a woman in Christ because you really want them to have that character because trust me, no matter how amazing you are, which, you know, yeah, there's, I, when I first got married, I'm like, I'm pretty godly. Like, I think, I think I might be amazing. And then I got married, I'm like, oh, wait, no, I'm not amazing at all. I have so much I need to grow in. And then we had kids, and I'm like, holy smoke, this is a whole new level of not amazing, right? And so there's just this reality of, like, how much you want to see in them the character to grow. I would say that's maybe the, my opinion, maybe the number one characteristic that's important after they're a follower of Christ um, then I would say that people around you that you trust, that love Jesus, agree with you. They confirm that this relationship is good and is healthy and is right. And then I would say that um, there's also peace. You know, there's also peace within your own, in your own heart that as you um, seek God, that you feel um, a peacefulness. Um, and I would say that you can practice for this day by, um, by seeking God now. And so anytime you have this feeling that God is telling you to do something or to like step out in this way or to do this thing or to live your life in this way, say yes and begin to learn what that relationship with Christ is like when he leads us and we follow him and you're having that experience of relationship with Christ. Because if all, if you have a pattern of you have this like prompting or this sense of, I think God wants me to do this or he's leading me in this way and you say no, then that's the pattern that you've created and you have um, begun to obscure the voice of God in your own heart and it becomes more difficult um, to, to discern and to hear, um, to feel confident about that. No, I wasn't even paying attention. I'm sure it was. I'm reading a thousand things coming through. Someone wants to know if you can hold someone's pinky. Like that. Is that, a, is that appropriate? Okay. I would guess. Um, all right, we're done. That's, uh, that's all you need to know. Pink, no. Um, <laughs> hey, so someone wants to know, what, how, do you, how do you manage or what do you do if you have regrets over past mistakes you've made in dating? Yeah, so I would say um, whenever we have regrets, a way that the enemy really likes to hijack that in our heart is to bring shame and to make us want to hide. Um, we see this in Adam and Eve whenever they disobeyed God or when they felt the sting of regret, they like, they, they like ran away and they hid themselves. And so what I'd like um, for you to know, um, anyone out there who has had a regret in dating, um, I would just say... Um, it's okay. God still loves you. Your identity is still intact. And that mistake does not, it has not um, marred um, your identity and your worth and your value and the image of God that is within you. But that whenever we step outside of what God says is good and healthy and right for us, then what happens is like that brings harm. It's like a wound. It's like you have like a, it's like you got stabbed in the side and it needs, you need help. You need remedy. You need medicine. The medicine is um, talking to someone, a safe person. 
that you can kind of feel through whatever whatever that regret says, whatever um, whatever fear is there, whatever struggles are there, to be able to have a safe person that you can talk through that, and that they can help you take the remedy of truth and of grace and of hope and, and help you apply it to that place. And so I would say you need a person, two people that you're confiding in and talking to about that and working through that with. And I would just say that there's healing. There's healing. There's no, um, there's no mistake that, trust me, you know, if there's a mistake in dating, I probably made it for a long time because I really, really struggled in this area of my life. And so, um, so I just want to encourage you to seek healing, seek um, help, um, and that there's there's hope for you, and that actually God will take that wound and bring it for your growth, and bring it for your um, for your good, and that you will um, what He can do is move you forward in greater strength from that place. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a few questions about what if you are gay, right? What about homosexuality? What about if you are gay? So first of all, uh, let, let me say this. Like, it, if you are gay, if you, if you believe you are, if you have, uh, been, have those tendencies, then, then know that you are deeply loved. Right? You're deeply loved by Christ, and you should be deeply loved by the church. Right? That, that is not intrinsically, in and of itself, unlovable. Right? Christ loves all people because they're his creation, and he has unique and special grace and love for those who come to him in faith. Now, the scriptures are pretty plain and clear that, that relationships, sexuality and relationships, are to be between a man and a woman. God created it that way with purpose. We don't have time to go into all the details around that today, um, but, but if you um, want to, you, with your youth pastor's help or something like that, get my information and email me. I'd be happy to like, help think through that with you as well. So the scripture would be very clear that, that the homosexual relationship is not um, in line with obedience to Christ. It's not the way it was created to be. With that being said, I want you to understand that having homosexual tendencies or same-sex attraction um, can coincide with being a believer. So if someone would say, Man, because you wrestle with this same-sex attraction, you, know, you're, you must not be a Christian. That's the same as telling someone that because you wrestle with pornography, you must not be a Christian. Because you have an issue of, of greed, because you are prideful, because you um, constantly you know, curse and, and are always angry, like you must not be a Christian. Sin is in all of us. The question is, who do we rely on to forgive us of our sin? And do we then walk in obedience to him with our sin? So there are many, um, m- many people out there. Um, there's well-known pastors uh, who, who would say, I have same-sex attraction. I still to, do to this day. I am not in a marriage relationship because I'm not attracted to the opposite gender. But they choose not to practice, um, practice out in their affection for the same gender. Right? So they're choosing to trust God even though their flesh is telling them, no, I think that this is what I want. And they're seeing that as this is part of the broken fall. We're all broken. There's sin. It affects all of us. And this is part of my brokenness and my sinfulness. And I have to bring that under submission to God and to his word. If he truly is the creator and he truly knows me better than, than I know myself, I need to trust what he has said on this, not what I feel today. Right? And so you submit that to him and trust I want you to hear me. I'm not telling you that's easy. It is uniquely hard in that situation. Someone who wrestles and struggles with desire to have sex, like before you get married, like you should obey scripture too and, and hold out, like be, be strong in that, have, have faith in that, be, be, have as much endurance in that as you, as you can and wait for marriage. But there's a different kind of hope for you, isn't there? It's like, but hey, someday I could get married and there it is. And someone would say, man, I wrestle with same-sex attraction. Like, like I, I think I'm gay. And the scripture would tell me not to enter into a sexual relationship with that person. Like, you're telling me, like, I never get to be in a relationship with someone? Yeah. 
And so I want you to hear what I'm saying. Like, I hear the, the difficulty with that. And I hear the, what sounds like hopelessness in that. See, am I ever going to get to be loved? And that's where you have to come back to these foundational truths. That you are loved more than you already know by the one who knows you the best. And that what he says is true and good and right and loving. And that he's even promised to one day, one day bring so much joy to you that all of the suffering of this world will pale in comparison to it. And as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, that he has comfort for you in all of your afflictions. And one of your afflictions might be this struggle. And he can bring comfort. He has comfort for that. That's not outside the bounds of God's grace and love. So trust him. Talk to some older, wiser, Jesus-loving people and say, I need your help in this. And if you don't have those people around us, then around you, then again, Get, get, get my email um, from your youth pastor. Have them look it up. Email the school. They'll share it with you, and we would love to help you with that. Our time is up. I love you guys. I'm praying for you. Let me pray a blessing over you before we dismiss you guys. Jesus, you are very kind and good to us. I pray that these students would know that they would believe that, that they would sink into their hearts this weekend and as they go forth from here. That they have value and that they're loved and that they're pursued and that there is a beautiful, beautiful day awaiting when they get to see you. May that shape the way that they pursue dating and love and affection and care. We pray these things in your name. Amen.